So for the recording, I will make the PPT only share. Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to the third session of on Data Development. This course, in this session now, we will be covering the research and register step portion of the topic. So, the following are the sub topics that we would be covering in this presentation. What I would like to do in the initial first few sessions is that you now you understand the basic uh, memory interface and then the basic uh, architectural feature. So, that when we get into the assembly instruction level details, you have all the background knowledge what is needed, especially from the ARM architecture perspective as well as in general about the processor architecture. So, you are well equipped and prepared to understand the assembly instruction and uh, understand deeper uh, details about how it is implemented and uh, how they are used in, in different scenarios. So, in this session we are going to cover what that is a nomenclature that ARM uses or what is the processor core and what is the CPU core. And then we will talk, talk about some of the key interface signals that comes out of the ARM processor core, then how the memory is interfaced with the processor core and different bus cycles that ARM support, then the register set and different operational modes that ARM supports there. And let us touch upon the research behavior there also because that is where the processor starts executing your instructions. And once we understand this, then we are ready to get into uh, deeper about instructions. Okay, let us carry on with our flow. So let us see what is ARM seven PDMA. So this this is the processor code that we would be you know covering in detail, especially for the assembly instruction. So we should be able to understand. You no, know, if the name is given like this of ARM core, what each of these letters mean. So, I have given only for this particular processor code what this name imply. 7 is one series of instruction set architecture that ARM has come up with. So, ARM has started with 1 and what we are studying now is the 7 uh, series in the instruction set architecture of ARM. And T means that it supports some more. As I have mentioned briefly in the earlier uh, discussion that a thumb mode is a 16 bit instruction bit mode which is for a compressed code execution where there is an embedded system where we have very very high limitation on the memory that footprint of a code that we can use. We can go in for thumb mode where 16 bit instructions are put in the ROM and that is read by the processor and it is expanded decompressed and then executed in the processor. So, we will not touch upon this now uh, there will be one session dedicated for some mode. So, just thought I will let you know what it means. D is a debugger unit it is present in the processor. So, that person you know as a developer we can run our code on the target platform and then we should be able to debug our code by single stepping it executing one instruction after the other and see the contents of the register. So, that we can understand how our program is running on the processor and if there is any bug in our code we will be able to fix it. So, processor supports the debugging by providing a separate hardware unit in it. And then multiplier unit and embedded IEC is for a built in debugger hardware. So, these are all for this two are for the debugging perspective and this is for high performance multiplier unit present in the system. So, we will go into those details later this is just an introduction about the naming convention in the nomenclature followed by all. Now, what is the processor core and what is the CPU core? See when we see uh, ARM based SOC it is already the ARM processor core is inside that chip SOC is a system on a chip. So, we have a processor core it could be ARM 7 or ARM 9 or ARM 10 
and that processor core is bought from ARM. So, this is the contribution from ARM, ARM uh, unit, ARM company, and then it could be integrated with the instruction cache or data cache and the MMU that also is provided by ARM, but that comes as a separate unit. So, ARM by interface. So, the whole thing when you have a bus interface and the cache and memory management unit, this all of them go into a single kit, which will be a CPU. When you say a board, development board with an ARM CPU in it, we will call that ARM CPU as one of these things, ARM 710 or ARM 720 or ARM 920. So, this kind of a CPU contains the processor code inside. We, when we talk about instruction set and the different register set and different modes, we are talking about what is inside this processor core. And when we talk about different signals coming out, these are all the signals coming out of this processor core, which is integrated with the rest of the unit and built as a single chip. So, I hope this un makes you understand the difference between a processor core, which could be the ARM 7. TDMA or ARM 9 TDMA or one of them and then the CPU core along with the different cache memory and other uh, functions what is required in the SOE, SOC they all combine together called as a CPU core. So, the other units that are used along with the processor core may not be from ARM, it could be from third party or it could be the module coming from the vendor who bought the ARM IP and integrating it with its own co-processor and then building a chip which will be used for a particular uh, end application. It could be for networking or it could be for data processing or it could be for graphics. So, this is how ARM vendors buy the ARM IT core from the ARM and build a system. Now, if you see the name like this, you should remember that it is the processor core. Now, these are the signals coming from this 7 TDMI processor core. You may wonder where are the pin numbers because we are all used to seeing a processor core with the signal input output so going out and going you know some inputs coming into the processor. We are used to seeing some pin numbers along with that, but here you what you see is only the signal description which are the input signal and what are the output signals and what are the different kinds of signals that go into the processor and group based on the function. Now, why are they not giving any pin numbers here? Again the reason being this is not coming at a single chip, this is a IP again in the intellectual property code which is going into the some other SOC. So, these signals will be going into some other modules within the chip and then those signals come out of the IC. So, those pin numbers it could be anything. So, it is independent of what is coming out of this core. So, that is dependent on the vendor who bought this ARM core and built an SOC. So, when ARM is giving the description of the signal, it does not talk about the pin numbers. Hope you understand this uh, here why there are no pin numbers in this description. Now, let us see what all this I know high level I will show you some signals, but we will not go into the every detail of signals here, but as soon as you know as and when we cover some parts of the modules, we will discuss about each signals also ok as we move forward. Now, one thing what we should remember is that when the processor is powered on, it has to start from some known state that is a processor needs to get an reset signal. So, there is a pin input signal going into the processor core which is a uh, reset bar, it, could, it is represented as n reset or you know in a signal description it will be shown as a reset bar. So, on uh, you know here what happens is when the signal is low it is active. So, what happens when the reset signal is activated the processor starts executing the code from the address 0 x or 0. So, this is the exercise of the address. So, I have given this many zeros because it is a 32 bit processor and the address range is uh, 0 32 bit from 0 0 to R X. Now, what is the clock going into the processor? So, any processor needs a clock. So, in the ARM processor we call it as M clock which is actually for a memory cycle clock. This is 
could be coming from the external circuitry. It could be a crystal or it's a crystal may be connected out of the sphere or it could be generator multiplied. So, whatever may be the modifications or changes going to have you know to this clock, what is coming into this is M clock, which is uh, on based on which the processor is and now you know that this is a 32 bit processor. So, address with the 32 they connect to the memory. Now, ARM processor has a unique feature where it has got two types of database data buses. I will talk about this later when it is required and how it is implemented. There are so many control signals of course, you know that for any memory cycle there must be some read right signals to be going on and then other request uh, kind of watch the bus data which is being read or returned into memory. So, those control signals are going out from this. Now, in the earlier session I mentioned that ARM is a bi endian processor. What does it mean? We can make the ARM processor run either as a big endian in the big endian mode or as a little endian mode. So, based on the signal given to this input it can it will behave as a big endian or little endian. So, you may wonder whether the signal needs to be you no know, always constant of course, if the you know the software running on the chip is always assuming that the big endianness is followed this should not change in between otherwise you will see the performance totally you know it would not work at all so totally. But if there is a requirement that this needs to be switched from little endian to big endian because of some application requirement that is left to the programmer and the system designer to take care of it. But the from the processor code perspective it senses this signal if it is 0 it behaves like little endian machine otherwise it behaves like a big endian machine. Now, any processor has to have some interrupt. So, all of you must be aware what the interrupts are for which is to indicate what is the in is there any action that needs processor's attention those interrupts will be generated by these uh, signals and they are connected to two input signals which is called IRQ and FIQ I will talk about that later fast interrupt and interrupt of course thing. Then there are other description a whole lot of signals which we will not talk about it now as in when there is a need we will talk about that ok. Let us go to the next session clock signal I mentioned that M clock is a memory clock which is going into that this is all state change within the processor are controlled by this clock. This is the main clock for all memory accessor and processor operation. Now, this M clock has a provision that you can slow it down to make the whole processor run slow if suppose slower peripherals or memory or needs to be integrated with the processor. So, you may wonder why this kind of flexibility is given in ARM because when the ARM IP is made it could be integrated with any kind of system it could be with a, a fast clock. Or a, you know processes with the fast clock or it could be integrated with the memory and other systems which are very slow because power requirements are less and which is the for a low end application then the processor should be uh, you know uh, configurable to run in any speed. So, M clock has a provision with the additional signal called N weight you can always set the clock signal to make it run slow. So, the internal clock is always taken from M clock signal and with N weight. So, you know any clock will be having a high end pulse kind of a thing I will show you the description of this clock and when N weight is added if it is low the clock is frozen as a kept as low. So, only when N weight is high that is 1 the M clock is taken in as a clock and the processor is running with the speed. So, if you want to stop the processor or stall the processor make this N weight low when the M clock is low and then you uh, keep it as long as possible where whenever you want that again for the processor to run you can make this N weight high and then when the M clock becomes high the processor starts running. So, this is another output thing coming out of the ARM processor code to just see 
what is the internal clock of the processor. So, this is actually E clock is the output of this two signal which were fed into the processor. Now, this as I mentioned n weight signal is used to set the memory cycle if lower memories are in use. So, this is all about clock signal. Now, I mentioned that ARM 7 TDMA is a one normal architecture. What is one normal? We have a single memory for both code and data. Now, so there is a only one address bus connected to the memory and there are some control signals apart from M rack and sequential access there is a MA address uh, this signal gives you what is the kind of transfer uh, I will explain this in detail in the next slide. So, now you see here now when this bus enable is given at 0 then ARM processor is connected to the memory to this data bus which is the bidirectional bus. So, what happens both while reading as well as writing the data flow through this bus. If suppose if bus enable is 1 these are the pins which are activated and there is a separate data in and data out bus. So, having a separate data in and data bus does not mean that it is a hardware architecture. We need to have a separate memory and separate address as data bus, then we can call it as a hardware architecture. This is simply again same one line in architecture, but only thing is the data could be multiplexed or it could be separate for input and output. And you know the range of addresses are 32 bit, so this are the maximum range of the addresses for the memory. So, both code and data reside here. So, when a processor is running it has to use the same address bus and the data bus to read the instruction as well as read any data that needs to be read in or written into through the same bus. So, you know that these two cannot happen together. Now, why do, why did, why do we need this? Um, in a typical environment where we want uh, ARM core to be connected to a external memory the bidirectional bus is used normally, but if it has to be connected within some internal circuitry some you know in the SOCs people can make use of this two buses for accessing the memory. So, only at a time only one of them can be used and it is the system designers choice whether to drive this pin as 0 or 1 and then use the appropriate data buses for interfacing with the memory. So, this kind of flexibility is given again because the ARM core is given as a IP and it can be integrated with any other processor to build an SP. Now, how is the memory access happen in the ARM? Address plus provides 4 GB of unique address space, you know the 32 bit maps to the 4 GB and the processor can transfer either word or half word or byte quantity. So, as, as I mentioned this uh, memory which is used is a byte addressable memory. So, ARM can transfer any of these data bits from the memory or it can write any of these 32 bit or 62 16 bit or 1 byte entity. So, who decides that the MAS input is a 2 bit input coming into no, uh, uh, sorry, to, to the memory actually it is driven by the processor. So, this encodes the size of the transfer. So, if a processor is transferring a half word it will put in the proper combination of bits to indicate to the memory that I am transferring a half word or a byte or a 32 bit pole. So, so based on this signal MAS signal coming out of the processor code the memory understands that the transfer size is one of these three and then accordingly it reads the data from the data. However, the memory system must ignore the bottom redundant bit based on the transfer. Let me tell you if suppose it is processor is driving this 1 0 as a combination that means it is doing a word transfer on the data bus. That means for a given address there are 4 bytes of value which is either coming out or to be read from the memory by the processor. Now, as you know the addresses of byte width by you know this 4 32 bits indicate that there are 4 bytes which are read or written and a single memory cycle. Because of this the bottom 2 bits 
are redundant because assume that thousand is the address. You have write four bytes. Now what will be the next address that you need to put it on the memory? Memory it has to be thousand four. That means you are jumping. The address is jumping from thousand to thousand four to thousand eight. That means the intermediate numbers that is zero one zero 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 one and one zero and one one are are not coming out of the address list because address is incremented every four bytes. So because of this. The bottom two bits will be ignored if it is a 32 bit access. If it is a half word access, you understand that uh, one bit is redundant, but if it is a byte address, every all 32 bits are valid addresses and that needs to be understood and uh, accordingly the memory has to act on it. So, in summary, ARM supports all kinds of transfers, both input as well as output. It can write into the memory in any of these word traces. Or it can read from the memory also in any of these processes, but when it is doing, it has to inform the memory that what kind of transfer size it is performing for a memory session. So, this is not this can change for from one cycle to the other cycle. Every memory cycle can decide whether it is it wants to do a any of this one of these transfers, then based on this, these bits are driven and the memory needs to support this. Now, let me give an example. Okay, let us take an example of this particular combination. That is A one of zero. This M A S no address bit one of zero is zero one. Okay, byte write on zero one. That means here this is a address bit one and zero. So once you are reading a byte, that means all the bits in the address bar are valid. So, if the byte is showing the 0 1 that means it is an odd byte which is read by the processor. Now, you have to remember that based on the middle engine or big engine this could be mapped to either a 1 byte from MSB or it could be a, a byte next to the LS byte. So, what I am saying is based on the NDNS of the processor you know this signal what is given the byte what is being read or written into is taken from the respective data buffer. So, if it is a little Indian you know that LS byte will come from this part of the memory whereas, if it is a MS uh, big Indian machine it will be the value will be coming from say if it is a lower byte it will come from the MS byte because it is stored as a higher address right. So, because of that what happens is wherever the byte is read is coming on whichever data bus it is copied into the lower byte of the register and then as a sign extender or it is filled with a 0 based on the kind of transfer which is being done. So, basically this helps in terms of transferring a word or a byte or a half word from the memory whatever may be the NDNS and then transfer that value to a particular place in the register. Now, let us see what is the what happens when a memory write is performed. So, this shows the LS byte is coming to the LSB here data bus. So, this is a little more then what happens is this data if it is a uh, word write it comes on all the 32 bits of data, but if it is doing a byte write that is the processor is trying to write one byte this byte particular byte of the what is there in the register into the data bus. So, it copies the same byte into all the four the eight you know bytes of the data bus and writes it. You may wonder why that single data is copied onto four. This is just a provision given you know, come, you know for the memory to use any one of this based on its convenience ok, but actually only one byte is getting transferred, but it is instead of sending it are leaving these other data bit data bus you know uh, things uh, empty this is all driven by the same data. So, that the memory could perform the uh, you can read any one of these bytes to copy into its location. 
if it is a half a transfer then it is driven on to both the 16 bits of the data bus. So, this is a way memory is getting written into different words the word with the know written into memory from the processor. So, can use the most convenient copy of the data ok. Now, let us talk about the bus thing. We call this processor bus interface as a pipeline. Now, what is that pipeline mean? It gives maximum time for memory to decode the address and respond to the address cycle. What it means is the address will be given ahead of the memory supply and the memory has a sufficient time to decode the address and put the data back into the data. So, this kind of pipeline mode is particularly useful for DRAM because DRAM has a row and a column uh, addresses and it has to resolve a particular cell in the DRAM memory and then get out the value. So, it it takes some uh, time for decoding the address and then putting the data out on the database. So, in the pipeline mode the advantage is that the address is given ahead of the uh, memory cycle uh, one cycle before. So, so that the decoding could can proceed from the memory side and it can be ready with the data and when the processor can read it from the data. So, this is what is address expressed in this and then in this mode address does not remain valid till the end of the memory cycle. So, there needs to be a, um, a say, you know agreement between the uh, memory and the processor the signal uh, details and then accordingly the address and data bit will be read by the processor. So, there is an address pipeline enable signal which indicates to the memory that it is in the pipeline mode. In the D pipeline mode could be used for SRAM and ROM kind of memories where uh, this kind of a delay is not needed from the between address and the data reading to the memory. So, I will tell you a small you know I will show you a small uh, bus cycle here. This is the M clock which I showed you that it is driven from the external security into the processor core. So, this comp you know this is a complete one cycle here. So, what you see here is it is a pipeline mode these are this is high signal uh, AP is other pipeline enable and M rack and SQ sequential is a combination which gives you whether uh, processor is in a sequential mode or in a um, what kind of a width of address it is being read. Now, address is coming out here and the data is read on this particular uh, falling edge of the M clock signal. So, this process requires memory access during the low cycle. So, what happens is during the cycle the earlier stage you know at this place address is available address is available in this cycle and the data is available in this cycle. So, you see that during this time address is put on the address bar and in this time at the end of this clock the data is read from there ok. So, now let us talk about different bus cycles I mentioned about sequential and non sequential let us see what they mean. A non sequential cycle requires the transfer to or from an address which is unrelated to the address used in the preceding cycle. What I mean by this is that suppose you look at the address bus and the data bus, there is one address coming out of the processor goes to the memory and the data is given out by the memory. Now, next address is coming, if this next address what is coming out of the processor is not related to the previous address that means they are not sequential ok. The random addresses coming out of the processor there is no relationship between one and the previous cycle and memory decodes every address and then puts the data into the bus. So, this is for a non sequential cycle where the, there is no relationship between subsequent addresses coming out of the memory cycle. Now, in the sequential case what happens is when you have you need to read a sequential uh, you know by bytes or word from the sequential locations the processor can put the addresses increment it one by one based on the word width whether it is being a 32 bit transfer or 16 bit transfer and it will also indicate to the processor that it is a sequential address. Now, what is the advantage once the memory knows the requests that are coming out from the memory processor are all going to be sequential 
then the memory could be ready with the data because it knows that if it is the processor is reading in at, at, at a thousand and uh, the width is 32 bit, then it knows that the next request is going to be from 1004 and the other one is going to be 1008. So, memory can prefetch the data internally without waiting for these addresses to come from the processor so that it can complete the cycle much faster. So, the sequential addresses are relatively faster than not sequential addresses. Now, what is internal cycle? Now, as I mentioned in the CPU diagram which where we have we saw the processor core sitting and then there are so many co-processors and other cache and memory management units in a single chip. Now, the same data bus and the address bus coming out of the processor core is not only connected to the memory, it is also connected to the co-processor or it could be connected to a, uh, some other units on the bus. So, when the processor is intending to do some transaction between itself to uh, with the, the other co-processors, it does not want any in, you know interruption or anything driven by the memory on the bus. It has to indicate to the memory that I am doing something other than talking to the memory. So, that is one way of informing the processor that I am you no, know, it is not communicating with the memory now, if this cycle is going to be used for something else. So, this is one scenario, and another scenario could be that the processor is busy doing some operation inside, you know, it could be doing. Um, um, MAC operation or some other arithmetic where it cannot use the address data bus for fetching either instruction, fetching an instruction or it is not using the bus for accessing the memory, it could say that it is in an internal cycle mode. So, these two are the different modes, the coprocessor mode is for informing that it is performing a coprocessor transfer and the internal cycle is for saying that it, it is busy with the internal operation and it cannot do any prefetching at this time. So, these are the four modes. So, if I ask you which are the modes where memory should not drive any signal onto the bus, it is very clear in both the both these modes because internal as well as coprocessor register mode it is nothing to do with the memory the processor is talking to either coprocessor or it is busy with the internal operation. If memory if the processor is doing a transaction on the bus using this cycle that means it is communicating with the memory. Either it could be non sequential accesses or it is a sequential access. So, based on that memory can respond according to the address which is coming out of the processor. I hope this four cycle different types of cycles are understood by all of you. Now, how is it communicated? This is the way the signal the, the combination of this mentioned you know uh, this is coming out of the signal ok. Based on this you can see that whether it is driven by the processor or it is coming as an input or output to the processor. This is a output from the processor to indicate that it is doing one of these things. If it is doing n or yes it wants the memory to be active. So, this uh, as I said m rack boy is a 0 is active. So, this means that memory needs to be active to take care of the decode the address and drive the data process. But if it is one memory just shut off and the processor is free to communicate either with the coprocessor or it is free to do whatever is internal operation it is doing. So, non sequential is simplest to form because no, no interact no, no no relationship between multiple addresses coming out of the processor and sequential this is a bus mode as, as I told you first address is given and then it says that I am starting a sequential cycle that means it is going to access the memory starting from this address to subsequent address. So, till this sequential mode is changing to non sequential or some other cycle either it is the process you know internal cycle or a co process cycle it will continue to read from the sequential addresses starting from the addresses. But one thing you have to remember that every cycle the incremented address is also put on the address bus ok, um, but memory can comfortably go and do the data access because it knows that the processor is interested in sequential address access ok. So, whether address is incremented either 2 or 4, so you may wonder why there is no incrementing by 1 
the reason being arm doesn't support a bite sequential burst mode. It doesn't make sense. You understand, right? Thousand. Suppose your processor wants to access only a byte from the address thousand, then the next address will be thousand and one, two, three, four. So when the processor could read all the bytes in one cycle, you know, by saying that I am reading a four byte value from memory, if it is trying to do a byte bus transfer at byte level, it's a waste of effort, waste of time, as well as waste of power. So normally, then well, you may wonder why is this? You know, um, half world is supported in the bus mode because we may have a system where the memory that you are having in that system has only 16 bit data. Okay, if the memory is a very cheap memory with a low cost, low cost uh, application, so we can't say that the arms of the CPU cannot work with the memory which has got only 16 bit data. Data. So ARM has provided that provision that half hour transfer to half hour transfer it can talk to a memory with a 16 bit data bus and it, it has to perform any operation all the operations of the memory only in the half hour mode and it could perform even bus transfers with the memory if the memory controller support ok. And memory system can even often respond faster as I told you in the sequential access memory system can respond faster ok. Now let us see what is internal circuit. Now I have already explained to you this is something to do with uh, operation performed by the processor internally and it is does not want anything to be activity to be happening on the address or data. So no prefetch is required and so processor does not do any operation, but at the end of internal cycle it can broadcast the address to start the next memory cycle. So, in preparation for the next memory cycle it can broadcast the address and the memory will decode that, but it will not drive the address data bus until a memory cycle has started they may be the next memory cycle could be a non sequential access or a sequential cycle, but anyway when the new cycle starts address will also be coming, but the memory has got the address ahead of the cycle, so it can do the decoding and then ready with the data ahead of time. So, that is the provision provided by this uh, particular support. So, co-processor register as I told you that uh, there could be a co-processor connected to the processor and uh, the transaction may be between the co-processor and the uh, processor, so memory needs to be um, discontinued or it should not drive any signal on the bus. Okay, so these are all the details about bus electrics. Now let us see what the reset signal is all about. This is n reset that means if it is low, it is the reset signal is coming out. Processor needs to take action. So normally the reset signals are driven by an RC circuit. Now we have low level causes the instruction be exhibited to terminate abnormally. So you know that when the processor is running, yeah, suddenly somebody comes and resets the board. Whatever is happening on the instruction execution is happening on the processor needs to be terminated and then the processor needs to start from a known state. So, that is the intent of reset or when the development board or the, the system that you have with the ARM core running and you switch on the system when it powers on the ARM has to come up with a in a known state. So, the reset could be either the processor is running in between somebody has given a reset signal or it is powering on for the first time whatever may be the situation the arm core needs to start from a known state. So, the reset is very important and that is the first thing what we all know should know what is the behavior of a processor when a reset is given to it. So, as I told you n weight should be high to for the n clock signal to be used right away otherwise if you hold the n weight as low then the clock is uh, held low and you have um, the, no stretching the signal ok, the clock is slow down because of that. Now, the supervisor mode, uh, I will not talk about the supervisor mode now you know in the, in the subsequent I don't know uh, within the few seconds I know I will be talking about that. Uh, this actually, um, this is a mode in which the processor starts to begin with and I will talk about bank registers before we 
say what is uh, the speciality of supervised learning mode. Okay. Now let us go into a register set and the different operational modes of the processor. Now this is the registers that normally as a user we would be using. So these are all 32 bit wide registers they are called R0 to R15, but these three registers which are shown in shadow and uh, no, they are all for special purposes we will see what they mean and CPSR is the current processor status register which talk, which has some conditional codes and uh, means about some internal operations. Okay. So, there are 16 data registers and one status register R0 to R13 are orthogonal general purpose register what this means is that this orthogonal means any instruction that you can do with R0 can be done with any other register. So, suppose if there is an add instruction and uh, you say that R0 comma R1 to R2 you could also, also write it as R5 to R6 to R7. So, these registers can be used you know in the uh, instruction where one of them could be used that means these registers can be you can comfortably use them based on which is occupied by some other value and which one is free for you to use the registers in your assembly instruction. Now, what is the shaded registers identify? They identify some special purposes. I talked about a lot of things about stack. So, in the previous discussion, so R13 is traditionally used as a stack pointer, and especially if it is used with a if the processor is now OS is running on the processor, then the OS operating system will assume that R13 is dedicated for the stack pointer. If suppose you are writing your own code, you are free to do anything you want because it's part of a set of orthogonal register. But especially if you need to uh, connect to another library or some uh, OS code, better not to use this R13 for some other purpose, general purpose. It should be reserved for stack. And R14 is a link register. Um, I can give you this, this brief example of what it means. Suppose there is a subroutine call. You now we will talk about those things when the instructions we talk about. So if a control is moved to some other through a subroutine call, the return address where after subroutine is executed, where the processor control has to come back is actually available in the PC because PC is incremented from the current instruction. So, that return address is actually saved in the link register so that on return of from the call, the return address could be copied back from R4 to R14 to PC so that the processor comes back to the instruction just after the subroutine call. Anyway, we will talk about this later. Just I thought I will give you some overview of what it is. R15, as I mentioned, this is the program counter where the next instruction to be fetched is always pointing at. So, R15 is pointing at the instruction to be fetched from the memory. Now, CPSR is a current program status register. Let us see what they contain later on. Now, program counter. As I told you, this is a 32 bit wide that uh, because all ARM instruction we call ARM state because it is not in thumb mode, it is called ARM state. Okay. So, in ARM state, it will be assessing 32 bit instruction. So, the PC will be pointing at set of 4 bytes, whereas if it is in thumb mode, it is 16. Now, when I say that it is pointing at set of 4 bytes, it is always accessing the instruction as a 32 bit bit. So, as I mentioned in the previous a discussion about memory interfaces if it is accessing an instruction from the memory the code the instruction is read in always as a 4 byte data. So, 4 bytes is no instruction. So, if it is reading as a 4 byte then you can assume that the least 2 bits the bit 0 and 1 are always 0 and it is mandatory that all instructions are 4 byte aligned that means no instruction can start on odd boundaries that means suppose you take an example of 1000, 1001, 1002, 1003 these are all different byte addresses instruction can start only from 1000 or 1004 or 1008 you cannot put an instruction starting from 1001 or 2 or 3 because always the processor reads from the memory all the instructions which are 4 byte aligned. So, it expects the instruction to be 4 byte aligned. 
So that means the PC will always give you these two bits zero. So non-constant bits are only 31 to 2 bits of an R15. R15. So you see the R15 instruction. Suppose because it is little different from ARM processor, it is different from other processor where it is the even the PC is part of the general purpose register set. So you can use PC also as one of the operands for the instruction. But it has to be used with the caution. Uh, I, whenever we talk about instruction, I will touch upon those things which you need to take care from the perspective of using the R15 as a general purpose register. Okay. Now, conditional flag. We have talked about this earlier. What are the things? You know, when some binary operation is done, how these flags are set? We understood. Now, this is the place it occupies in the CPSR register. So the MSB4 bits are mapped onto this flag. Now these are all left unused and we will see what all these other bits mean. So normally any processor you know there will be some bits reserved for feature use so that the processor can be extended with the next family of you know, ISA and new instructions can be added, new conditions can be added so these bits are left unused. They are divided into four states, four classes. The condition flags, of course, map maps onto these flags. So negative zero or terminal overflow flag. As you know, overflow flag is for signed arithmetic. Now let us see what is this interrupt mark bit start for. I told you that interrupts are always generated. It could be from internally also, but any external interrupts coming are connected to two bits of the control pins of the processor. So, they are IRQ bit which is uh, coming into the processor. So, if this IRQ this particular I flag in the CPSR is set that means even if there is an interrupt coming from the external system it won't be recognized by the processor. So, if suppose if you want to disable the interrupt you want the processor to be not to be interrupted because you are doing some critical job and hopefully it is not no right for returning then you can disable this interrupt mode you no know, flag by setting these bits to 1 then no interrupt will be resonated by the processor. Same thing for FIQ, FIQ is a fast interrupt um, you may wonder what is the difference between these two actually the priority of this is you know higher than the priority of this that means you can connect any interrupt from any source which needs to be attended to without any delay that interrupt has to be connected to this particular input and any other serial port or any USB or any other devices where it can afford to wait for, for servicing this interrupt it can be connected to IRQ. So internally when both the interrupts come into the processor the FIQ interrupts are given higher priority this will be serviced first before coming into this interrupt. Okay. Now what are the processor modes? This is very important uh, concept you should understand. So, these 5 bits the lower 5 bits of the CPSR correspond to the processor modes. It could be privileged or non-privileged all of you must be aware of would have done some course on operating system. So, there are privileged and non-privileged states in the processor the user mode or kernel mode. So, the privileged mode is basically it is for operating system or some um, supervisor mode, non privilege is for a normal usage, normal users program to run on the processor. Now, you can understand that compared to this privilege mode has a higher privilege right. So, in the privilege mode they have access, full access for read and write of the whole CPU. So, you can change anything you know if the processor is in this mode they can go and modify any of these bits in the CPSR whereas in the non privileged mode the user who is in non privileged mode has only read access to the control bits. It can know the current mode what is the current status of these you know whether the interrupts are masked or not whether it is in thumb or mode or not what are the flags set by the processor. But in the non unprivileged non privileged mode you cannot modify any of the bits in the CPSR. Okay. Let us see. 
Now, what are the different modes supported by the ARM? Now, except the user mode which is in the top, all other modes are privileged. Okay, that means in these modes, the CPSR can be modified. Now, this also has additional feature. When I say that in the privileged mode, the CPSR can be modified. In here in this mode, it another register which is called SPS card, which is called saved program data, is also made visible to the program. That means I will take give an example. Suppose the processor is running in a user mode. Okay, assume before getting into the user mode, some uh, supervisory code was running, and then it has enabled the FIQ bit in the CPSR. That means if any interrupt comes, the FIQ interrupt will be processed, and it will go to the service routine in the ISR. Okay, while I will not no let us not worry about how the service routine is uh, run now. We will talk about the interrupts later, but it suppose if the processor is moving from the user mode to fast interrupt mode because of an interrupt coming, it will have a visible another register it's called the SPSR where uh, automatically the CPSR is copied into the SPSR register. Why is it done? Because when it is changing from user mode to fast interrupt mode, the original more value was actually referring to the user mode. Now, when it is in the fast interrupt mode, it is going to be changed to fast interrupt mode. So, you have to have the old content of the CPSR because even the in the user mode process, you know, we, our program would have been running and then we may be performing some additional or arithmetic operation and the conditional plans would have been changed. But when it is entering the FI, it may perform some arithmetic operation and those conditions of the CPSR flag would have been overwritten. Now, after the interrupt protein, when you come back, you will not get the same state of what you had prior to the interrupt. So, to achieve that, what ARM has done is it has made visible another uh, register when they are entering into this mode and automatically the hardware takes care of copying it. So, this I am I know, uh, telling you right now to just make uh, you know, have an idea of why SPSR is needed. But we will talk about it later on in detail. Okay. Now, apart from user mode, you see that there is a system mode also, which also has the same set of registers as user. There is no special set of registers. These are all. I'll show you what are the special set of registers which, which uh, become you know visible in these different modes. But in the system mode, the only difference is that it can change the CPSR content. So, what is the use of that? I will explain to that. So, in the subsequent uh, session, okay. So, the processor mode can be changed by a program that writes directly into the CPSR or by hardware when the code responds to an exception. Okay. So, when the mode so, you may wonder when is the mode changing, how the mode of the processor can be changed, the least 5 bits. It could be by a, any interrupt coming. So, from the interrupt it will know that okay, this is the interrupt coming from the signal. So, automatically it will be set or it could be done by the user program. Okay. Now, you may wonder that there are so many registers now. I showed you initially that only these registers are there in the processor. We talked in length about this processor. Now, we are seeing whole lot of registers. Please understand that the registers which are shown with this here are the special registers which are visible. So, if you ask me physically how many registers are there in the processor, forget about the which mode they are in, physically there will be 37 register means you have to add up all the shaded portion and the user mode registers, it will all be 37. Now, Again, let us go back to the old example of from the user mode you come to FIQ mode when you on interrupt. What happens is suddenly during this FIQ mode, the this register is visible and you get a, a new set of registers which are this four, you know, this uh, eight register, uh, other seven registers. Now, what happens to this? Actually, 
in the FIQ mode, if you say RA, it will be accessing this, not this thing. Okay. So, in the FIQ service routine, if you write move FI to FI comma 100, the 100 is written into this register and original content of this will not be disturbed. So, based on the mode in which you are, you will be accessing those special registers with this name. Now, what happens to this register? They remain the same. So, it is same as this register. So, physically only one set of these registers are there, but they are shown multiple times because in each more, how they each more you see the register is what is shown here. So, what is the advantage of having so many registers in FIQ mode? Because you do not have to when you are jumping into the service routine, you do not have to save this content because you are getting a new set of registers here. In the ISR, you can use them and then come back without interrupting the normal flow of program. So, that is the implication of these registers where you say that these are different branch registers are available in ARM. So, all custom modes except system mode have set of associated bank registers. So, what I said was in system mode, the bank registers map ok or same as user register and their bank register map to user mode register. When the processor mode is changed, the bank register from the new mode replaces an existing register ok. So, for an example on the enter request if suppose R13 and R14 are accessed in the new interrupt in IRQ, they will be accessing the R13 and R14 of IRQ and not the original user mode register as I explained you earlier. So, user mode register R13 and R14 are not affected by this operation ok. Whereas, R0 to R12 in IRQ are, are same as the user mode register. So, what is the registered bank? Register bank is a whole register file. Whatever I showed you on different register, different modes, all those registers are called as a register file. So, the ARM 7 CDMA processor core has an additional features to enhance the performance. What are they? The register file has two read cores and one write core. What do I mean by this? That means in the same cycle, two registers can be read simultaneously, ok, and a one register could be written into, ok. So, typically if there is a one register and then there is a only one port available, one read and write port, you can either write in one clock or write a read from the register in one clock. But if the, the whole register file is given uh, multiple uh, no, two read ports and a write port, you can do two operations at the same time. You may wonder why is it required. If you remember the operands that are required for any addition or subtraction, there are two operands needed, right. So, those two operands could come from two different registers which are in the register file. So, you may say that add R0 comma R1 comma R2 that means you are get taking two parameters R1 and R2 from the register file and because register file has two read ports the both the operands R1 and R or two operands can be read from the register file simultaneously in single cycle. So, that is why uh, ARM has provided this multiple ports. And if you remember that R15 is also part of the register file and it is a special purpose. So, it is a program counter. Now, you know very well that when the program has to execute, it has to increment the program counter and keep on accessing the instruction subsequent sequential addresses from the memory. Now, where it has to be written into? It has to be written into R15 which is part of the register file. So, to enable incrementing or you know uh, changing the value of our PC irrespective of without you know any uh, interruption happening to the operands being read from the register file. ARM has provided two additional ports only for R2 team. What does it mean? For accessing the R2 team, you can use these ports. So, these ports allow reading and writing of R2 team independent of any read or write happening on the other registers in the register file. So, they can happen in parallel. So, effectively, there are three read ports and two write ports, but one is very unique and special that it can be used only for 
accessing the program counter. Why we need to access the program counter every cycle? Because every cycle, every instruction being executed, the program counter is modified because it has to increment to the next instruction. So that means the program counter has to be written into with a new address. So we need a separate port for that so that instruction can keep on modifying the R15 without affecting the data accesses from the other registers in the file. So this is what happens in the last bullet shows that you can update the R15 without any issue. So now let us see what are the special mode privilege mode registers are for and uh, let us take an example this special registers like tag pointer and link registers are for two bank registers ok. This is used for holding the stack pointer and return address. So why do we need special registers for every privilege mode? Again coming back to the example of fast interrupt, when fast interrupt happens, uh, any interrupt happens, it is going to another routine and then it executes the uh, whole set of instructions. So he, when it is using up some of the user registers, it has to save those registers into stack. So we need a, a special stack for the interrupt routines, right. So it can form a point to a different memory location in the memory. and uh, the saving and restoring of registers can happen with those stacks. So each of privilege modes can be initialized with different regist you know, stack addresses so that they can all point to different stack addresses so that any saving of registers could be done based on the mode it, it is in. We will talk about this in some more in detail in the subsequent lectures. Uh, it is better if you understand that it is needed, it is provided for the sake of saving the registers which are used by those privilege mode per functions ok, the exception handlers. But FIQ is given additional registers because it does not have to save those registers because it is getting those set of registers so it can perform the operation much faster than the rest of the privilege mode uh, exceptions. So as I told you when the CPS of contents are modified the new registers become visible based on the which privileged mode is written into the CPS and uh, the R14 is a link register which preserves the PC value before the exception or the interrupt has happened and then so that it can be restored from this value it can come back to the instruction after the exception which is to be executed ok. So, let us see what uh, reset does after the end reset was made see how a reset is given to the processor it has to be made low ok and then dot high. Now I am coming back to reset because earlier I could not explain you about what are the different modes available. So now having understood different modes are there and they have a special uh, registers reserved for each of the modes now you can understand and relate why on reset mode the processor need to enter the supervision. So when reset is given ok either because of power on or it is given forcibly by some external circuitry the processor enters the supervisor mode. What does it mean? The LSD 5 bits of the CPSR is made as 1001 which corresponds to supervisor mode. If you recall I told that supervisor mode has the same set of user registers ok, but it has got access to SPSR as well as it has, it has got its own SPSR as well as it has got a right access to the CPSR ok. So what happens is on this is whatever may be the value which is saved in R14 and the currently what is there in the CPSR is copied into these two registers because it is getting two additional R14 SPC and SPSR SPC in the supervisor mode. So it saves the current address. So current uh, okay value actually this must be a PC to R14 okay and then disables IRQ. It saves the PC value and the CPS the current PC value and the uh, CPS value to SPS and it disables this interrupt. So on power on on reset it makes sure that no interrupts are enabled. 
and then it clears the bit. That means it is going to start in ARM mode, not in TAM mode. And then the PC is loaded with a new value. So actually, this has to be corrected as PC. Okay. So PC is moving to this. So current PC, wherever it is, is moving to this. Maybe it could be used by later on for debugging purposes. You know, when was the interrupt given? So, but if it is in a power on, they are having unpredictable values. So if they are saved into this register, and then the PC is loaded with a new set of value, which is a 0, 0, 0, 16. So actually, program ARM processor start executing from this set on reset. Okay. So this is the reset behavior. It gets it into supervisor mode and then comes back to normal ARM user mode and starts executing from 0, 0, 06. But it saves the PC value and CPSR into these special registers, which are than registers in the supervisor mode. So this is the purpose of supervisor mode and uh, this is also used for operating system routines. Then if suppose our OS is also running on your system and your user applications will be running in user mode and uh, OS code will be running in super, supervisor mode. So, so after our reset, all the register value except PC and CPS are in the mode. Okay. So this is the, now we are coming to the end of the class. In this session, we learned about what is a processor core and CPU core, what are the interface signals. We talked about you know, the multiple data buses available and what are the different signals available uh, to interface with the memory and uh, different transfer sizes possible. And then we talked about bus cycles, which is sequential access or non sequential access or internal cycle, or it is a co processor cycle. So, we talked about this. And then we talked about we understood about register set where bank registers are there, and based on the lower five bits of the CPSR, different modes are decided, and based on the mode, different bank registers become visible, and there is a special saved process program process process state register which is used for saving the CPSR content in the So, and then we talked about reset on reset when the pass enters the supervisor mode, and then saves the PC value and CPS or current CPS or value into SVC special register and then it starts executing from the address 00. So, with this we stop this session and uh, hoping to see you in the next session to learn more about our architecture and we will be covering uh, the instructions and before that we will talk about pipeline supporting the processor in the next session. Have a nice day. Thanks for listening. Take care. Bye.